why don't uh, why don't we get started? Uh, first, I'd like to welcome everybody here. Uh, it's great for every, for uh, you to come uh, to this seminar on such a beautiful evening. And uh, I'm predicting that over the next few months, it will start to get cooler. And uh, so there's a tendency to want to take advantage of the warmer weather. And so it's great to see you all here. I also want to say hello to Giorgio Bazzevi, who was a teacher of both of ours, I guess. And he's the one who taught me international finance here at the Bologna Center some years ago. Right. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay, anyway. Um, we are uh, delighted uh, that uh, Professor Tito Cordella uh, has agreed to give his inaugural uh, lecture this evening. Um, Tito is a uh, grew up in uh, Modena, not far from here, Parma. but uh, Parma, scusa. Uh, anyway, somewhere 40 Bologna. <laughs> on the way, on the way. On the way. From Bologna, yeah. and uh, he did his, uh, his undergraduate work here at the University of Bologna and has his PhD from the Université Catholique de Louvain, and uh, began his career as an academic at uh, the University of Pompeo Fabro. That they say it right? Pompeo oh, Fabro. Yeah, Fabro. And uh, then he went to the, after several years there, he uh, went to the International Monetary Fund in Washington, D.C., uh, where he worked in various capacity, capacities, including the Asia Department and also in the Research Department. Uh, and then he uh, apparently was poached uh, at the World Bank. Uh, where he served a lot of roles, including uh, chief economist for Brazil. He ran the Brazil office uh, uh, there, uh, deputy chief economist for Latin America and, and other roles. And we were uh, very fortunate to be able to uh, convince him to come back to Italy to be uh, a, our uh, Vera and Stefan Zamani chair uh, at, here at SAIS Europe. Um, we're really uh, happy to see that Stefan, I saw that uh, Vera earlier. She's, she's teaching downstairs. Oh, she's teaching downstairs. Okay. Well, this, this, uh, this chair was established uh, by our, um, uh, actually the chair of our advisory council and Hopkins trustee, James Anderson, uh, in honor of Professor Stefan Zamani and Vera Zamani. And so it's the, the Vera and Stefan Zamani uh, uh, chair and um, it, it in development economics and uh, Tito does a lot of different things in his research. Uh, some of us, including myself, would call it development economics, particularly on the finance side. Uh, and we're going to be hearing from him today on developing countries' debt and the new international financial architecture. Uh, but um, he's also done work on on trade. He's done work on energy and the environment. He's done risk and uh, natural disasters and everything. So he's a very uh, eclectic economist, which is exactly the kind of economist that we uh, like to see here at uh, at SICE. So um, it's great to have you here, Tito, and uh, it, the floor is yours. Okay, my set. Okay, Mike, thank you very much for these very nice words and for the very warm welcome I received in Bologna. Honestly, when I was offered this opportunity to come back to Bologna and to come back to go to go to come to size, this has been a real no brainer. <laughs> it was the kind of job I really wanted to go back to academia and to come back to Bologna where I started struggling with Georgia Basel economic models many years ago. So it's a long journey. It um, I don't know if it is over, but just went <laughs> all the way to the circle. So let me just present today. This talk, I try to do being in size, a talk that is sort of looking at interdisciplinary talk that is based upon some, some recent research I made with Andy Powell at the IDB and now with uh, uh, your former colleague, Andrea Presbitero, uh, that went back to, to Washington, but we are neighbors. So it's pretty easy to get together and to do some work of a copy shop regarding sovereign debt. And actually what I'm trying to talk today is I will start with a brief survey of what is from an economist from the from an economist perspective sovereign debt? Why do country borrows? And the real question is that why they often repay? I will then go through the role of international financial institution, 
and to try to explain what is their role in international financial architecture, why they land, and why they need something that we call seniority, mainly the fact that they are paid when other lenders are not paid in order to fulfill their mandate. And then I will discuss a little bit, and this is based on my work with Sandy Powell, why, what IFS, IFI, such as the IMF and the World Bank, but in this sense is mainly the IMF, and I will explain you why, should and should not do if they want to protect this seniority. And then the latest part of my talk that is based on some current research with Andrea Presbitero is the most challenging as it's highly speculative. But the question is that what is the future of international financial architecture of international financial institutions such as the IMF or the World Bank in a world where non-traditional lenders such as China are gaining a prominent role. And when this prominent role may jeopardize the seniority of international financial institutions as they desperately need in order to fulfill their mandate. We're opening with some open question to see what is the future of international financial architecture, architecture when you move from a world of cooperation, mainly among uh, the main, main multilateral and the Paris club to a more less uh, a different world in which some of the agents tend to compete more. So this is the outline of my talk. And I really start by sovereign borrowing. And mainly the question is that, that we want to address is why country borrow? Actually, country borrow from the same very for the very same reason why consumer borrow. They borrow to smooth consumption in the sense when they're hit by a shock, they want to pursue countercyclical fiscal policy, and need to borrow more. To invest, to invest in projects, the PNR, PNRR is one example, or just to splurge. And as, as much as many of our Italian citizens may be tempted to buy a fancy car, mainly presidents in the developing world may be tempted to buy a fancy presidential airplane. The main difference comes between when you look at individual versus countries, the main difference comes when repayments are due. Because while in many countries, maybe not in Italy, courts may force individual to repay, it is very difficult to force country to repay. So the question is that for quite a while, the reason it was very difficult was really based on the doctrine of absolute immunity that really came from the absolute state, is obeying in nature, when he says that the law, law is the command of him or them that have the sovereign power. So something that doctrine of absolute immunity that went from the, mainly the 19th through mid 20th century, precluded a lawsuit against a sovereign without the sovereign consent. consent. And this both, in the country legal system or abroad. And the most important thing that changed a little bit in the 20th century is the fact that absolute immunity applied both to commercial transaction between foreign states and pri private individual uh, from other states. So it's not just the sovereign borrowing and lending, but also the sort of commercial transactions that are linked to state. So the question is that how could sovereign debt exist under absolute immunity and this story is what we said was gunboat diplomacy. My preferred example, my preferred example is the case of Venezuela in 1902, now three, when Venezuela experienced a civil war, foreign property was destroyed and the government stopped paying debt. And at this point, the main country involved in these debt defaults that were Britain, Germany, and Italy decided to send gunboats to the uh, Venezuela's coast and mainly blockaded the post of La Guiar and Puerto Cabello, says custom house, but uh, <clears throat> President Cipriano Castro refused to, acqui to acquiesce. And so, so what happens that in 1903, according to the image of the Pipa Crimea, what happened is Germany bombarded for San Carlos and bombarded for San Carlo, and Castro agreed to an arbitration to a gradual liquidation of debt, and Britain, Germany, and Italy, that's actually sent the boat for the blockade, say, and they were offered a preferential payment of about 30% of claims. So this is the old doctrine of absolute immunity that started to change a little bit in the 20th century, and maybe in the, mainly in the 1950s, 
because of the role of state on of Soviet state on enterprises that were operating in the US. In fact, the US said there is no reason to give uh, apps to give sovereign immunity to commercial firms just because they're part of the state, because the state is a communist state. And the result of this is the Foreign Soviet Immunity Act that mainly allows private to sue a foreign government in US courts if complaints, complaints relates to commercial activity. The US, uh, the UK sort of followed it, but that in the US, late Judge Scalia in, his, in a very well-known uh, decision that is the Republic of Argentina versus Veltover decided the sovereign bonds of Argentina were commercial activities. And so should be considered, could be, should the US court courts a jurisdiction of making repayment of Argentinian debt. And actually, this case open to the most uh, um, cheered uh, history among if you ever talk with vulture fund managers, they love the case of Helicot Associate versus Banco de la Nación, in which Helicot bought um, uh, a bunch of non-performing Peruvian debt before the Brady deal. And uh, after Peru, Peru refused to pay in full uh, Elios suit in the New York court, and it obtained a judgment against Peru. At the end, they convinced a court in Brussels to suspend the payment on all Brady bonds if the claims on Helicot were not uh, fulfilled, and to avoid another major uh, default on all Brady deal, Peru gave in and paid $56 million to, uh, to Helicot. And the reason most case is the case in which NHM, NML against Arge capital against Argentina, in which Judge Greece allowed uh, the uh, US allows uh, NML capital with uh, a venture fund to say to through through court order to save Argentinian uh, assets. And so they say this fregata, this La Libertad, that it was on the out of the coast of Ghana. And they were seized by the gang and authority. At the same time, Christina Kirchner, that now in this poster wants to bring back La Fregata, was forced to uh, fly on commercial planes, on to charter commercial private planes, because if you fly with the official airplane, this whole time could have been seized by the US authorities. So this is the story. So, but if I have to give my hunch of this long story, is the despite a few successful cases um, like Helicot against Banco de la Nación, the ability of creditor to say sovereign asset is very limited. And I think it by itself, it would not sustain the existing stock of sovereign, of sovereign credit that it, like in, in, uh, in 2020 was $84 trillion, now is about $100 trillion, that is the order of magnitude of the world GDP. So it's not clearly the $56 million that uh, Helicot were able to get from Banco de la Nación that can sustain this debt. What we economists know is that the reason why the foreign debt, sovereign debt is sustainable is because default is costly. It's costly because it brings economic disruption, so it brings a lack of market actors for a while. And what I will say, and this is what our colleague Guido Sandleri has worked on from a while, we bring political turmoil, there'll be political, political economy reasons uh, while country want to repay. So if there is a recent paper by Christophe Trebesh that once a, if a country gets a hard default, it will take, uh, after five years, it would be, its GDP per capita would be 95% uh, on average of what it was before the crisis. So defaults that are more excusable uh, are less costly for a sovereign and probably are not costly at all. If creditors see that the country want to cooperate, are much more benign. So there is economic disruption. There is this work again by Cruthers and Trebech that shows lack of market access. If a country defaults and have a large default, this is haircut over 60%, it takes like 12 or 16 years to get access, on average, to get access. If, even with, with an haircut of between 30 and 60%, it will take like five years. So countries are denied market access for a while, and this can be a big deterrent to default. But I think the very reason is that the false co the defaults brings to political turmoil. This is when President De La Rue had to flee, like uh, uh, the US, um, uh, the, U the last US forces out of Saigon, this is out of La Casa Rosada in, uh, in 2002, 
to fly because of all the turmoil. So my real story is that what politicians, except you are able to orchestrate a default that is popular, and Argentina tried a while, there was sometimes that Korea tried in Ecuador, usually a default brings a major political turmoil and politicians are just out of office forever. And this is, I think, what it is the highest incentive to pay back. Because if you just look at economic incentives, there are all this literature based on the recent paper by Cristina Reggiano. And many they saw that the kind of discount rate that you should apply in order for be not economic profitable for a country to default are very unreasonable. So economically, it could probably be a good idea for a country to default more to the part of this why country pay back. And what I think this is really my hunch, it's not based on the research, well, my own research is that country pay back because uh, the political cost of defaulting can be can be huge. So this is the first part. This is why sovereign debt exists. The second part we want to look is at what is the role of international financial institutions, such as the World Bank and mainly the IMF and the World Bank. What do they do? How are they part of this picture? But mainly IF, IFI exists to reduce the cost associated with financial crisis. This is mainly the IMF and to foster poverty reduction, sustainable development. This is mainly the World Bank and the Regional Development Bank. And the truth is that international financial institutions lend to countries below market rates. And the reason why they can lend below market rates is because they are repaid when other creditors are not. And this is for the very reason that they are repaid when the other creditors are not, they lend when nobody else would. And this is so, the fact that they are repaid is very critical as their function. But the question is there is no international bankruptcy that can enforce the seniority of international financial institutions. So the real question is that what, what is it makes them prefer creditors and what it is really, what is what these preferred creditors uh, really entail. And this is, we go back to some, uh, so what is the preferred creditor status that we discuss a lot today is not, a legal status or a legal obligation of government to give the World Bank, the IMF, regional development banks such the ADB, the African Development Bank, the Asian Development Bank, priority over other lenders. What it is, it is the practice, and now just take these words that are from some lawyer from the World Bank, it is the practice or custom of borrowing member countries is the practice of borrowing member countries of continuing to receive their loans from the bank of the IMF exchange during periods that are unable to service all their external debts in accordance with their terms, which other creditor have requested in this practice. And this is the fact that other creditor have request, requested, and in the fact they are repaid when the other are not, and the other somehow accept uh, this to be the case. And uh, and really, do you see that this really happened? If you look at the number of countries in default, if you look at a huge number of private defaults, could be up to 90 countries in default, no country in the world in the 100 days. Some of the countries were in default in the late 1990, you see now late 2010 and 50 countries. There are a lot of countries in default from the Paris Club, which is really 20, but there are very few countries that are in default on the IMF and the World Bank. And if you zoom in the IMF and the World Bank, there is no more country in default on the IMF because the last two, two Somalia and Sudan, we are their arrears in 2020 and 2021. Uh, Zimbabwe clearly arrears with the IMF before, but Zimbabwe not yet clear their arrears with the World Bank. And the other countries that are in default on the World Bank are Syria and Eritrea. So it's really clear countries that are. Uh, in a situation of major uh, difficulty and turmoil of the political region. So really there is no more a sort of default in international financial institution. And the reason is that, the reason there is no default because what, what the uh, pre-precretary state entail is the fact that official lender can lend much cheaper. And usually the standard terms are around 100 basis points over the risk free rate. This year, if you look at this, is the World Bank. If you look at this number, it looks a little bit com confused because last year, after the Barclays scandal, the World Bank doesn't use any more LIBOR, but use Euro LIBOR, while it used the SOPR, the interbank rate in the US that is risk free. 
So if you take the LIBOR in the US, the LIBOR in Europe is 50 over LIBOR. But if you take the if you take the the soft the the secure overnight financial rate in the US, the cost is much higher because uh, such a rate is a risky rate the lower. So the fact is that you can, but this doesn't matter. Let, let me not enter this unless somebody is interested. So usually countries can borrow from the IMF on the World Bank around 100 basis points and can buy 100 basis points over the risk free rate when if they try to access the market and these are EMB global, so our emerging market, the cost can really skyrocket. If you look at during the COVID crisis, the EMB spread went up 700 basis points. So the reason is that in terms, the reason you borrow from international financial institution is because in terms of, in times of turmoil, you can get access to a, to a, to a risk-free rate or almost risk-free rate. And this is the reason you want to repay is because the way repaying is a way of maintaining access to this risk-free rate should a future crisis occur. The other reason is that here you look at the, uh, at the COVID crisis. During the COVID crisis, while private and international capital flows turn negative, turns out the international financial institution increased uh, substantially their lending of the order of $150 billion. That more or more is the same amount that country lost from a private capital market. Yes. The more technology in the time. Which word? Uh, no, Ukraine is not there. These are the latest. So I do not have the latest on Ukraine. Uh, it's also in 2021. I didn't. Have... I don't know what I see, but now I think threats are going up, both for the Ukraine war and for the tightening of the US monetary policy. So I think usually you have this. Uh, it's not a taper tantrum as it was a few years ago, but a similar effect. I don't know what the costs are, but probably I think it's in the three, 400 basis points. But it's something you can look. So, despite the fact of being critical to uh, the operation of international financial institutions, the preferred creditor treatment is not uh, part of a legal contract. And is described as a market custom, custom. And the real question is that, until recently, this is what motivated my research with uh, Andrew Powell. If there is no paper provided an explanation of my of my of why this can be a self-enforcing equilibrium, why can't repay if uh, they are not forced to repay? And in, in a recent paper published in 2021, we provide a theoretical justification on for the existence of preferred lenders and a rational for how they may improve welfare. And this is a sort of, a sort of complete markets. Without entering too much in, in the detail of this, it is a sort of a, theoretic, a theoretical paper. Let me just briefly illustrate the storyline. And our, what we prove is that international financial institutions enjoy preferred title treatment because they can commit to lend every country at the same close to the risk free rate. So there is no way they can change rates because this is part of the uh, bylaws of international financial institution. And what they can do, and is that until recently, they can credible commit on the total amount they collectively lend. So if you take a project, you go, uh, let's not say, I wouldn't say Argentina because it's but you go to the usual classical program, there is a sort of agreement between the IMF, the World Bank, the uh, uh, Inter-American Development Bank, you see Latin America was the case of Ecuador recently, for how, how much all would lend and the total amount is something the country should pay back. And it is exactly what makes lending, the fact that they can commit the amount they lend so they can control quantity, this allows to fix a price in which country pay back. And so by coordinating the amount of lending they collectively do, they can commit to lend at the risk rate. And this is something private market cannot do because if the private market tended to offer the risk free rate, somebody else would be a dilution of claims, some other creditor would enter in, would offer lending in a slightly risky way, and this would pay, this, this lender would 
get the risk the risk adjusted rate and for the previous one at the risk free rate was not would not be any more incentive compatible to that so the question is the, the argument of the dilution if i want to give you that there is free rate and you accept it but then chris arrives said no no i lend you more at the risk adjusted rate the guy chris get the risk adjusted rate and but it's, i would default in this situation because the stock of that is great and my i wouldn't be any more willing to lend at the risk of free rate so what we show is that atomistic private lenders are not able to coordinate to replicate this contract nor could competing in the so if you have two IF, international financial institutions that try to uh, if you have the in, international monetary fund and the intergalactic monetary fund that they compete if you go to the first one and you get a loan the other say come you can default and come to me and this this competition would destroy the incentive of the first lender to provide uh, any lending that there is free rate. So the policy title way of the, our paper, and I, I've just given you just a few highlights that probably uh, a little bit obscure is the fact that IFIs can help countries coping with major shock, but there are uh, uh, a limit on the amount they can lend if they want to maintain preferred credit or treat. And it's very clear if you go to the Greece crisis, at some point Greece repaid private lender, repay some samurai bonds while defaulting on the IMF. Then it repaid the IMF, but probably will never will take forever to repay the European stability mechanism of the European Central Bank. And if you look at what is the, the so the case, the recent clay case of Argentina, that we, when the, the first time I presented this paper, the subtitle was Would Christina pay Christine back? Because there was this idea <laughs> thing about Christine, Christina Kirchner, uh, Christine Lagarde. The fact is that uh, Argentina in, during the pre, one of the previous year, the previous crisis, one of, received a relatively small package of the IMF in 2001 and paid it back. Now it bore a huge amount of money, the 50 billions. Well, and now the IMF ended up rolling over this debt. It's very unclear on which term would be paid. And actually nobody really considered this IMF credit senior. Why? Because the IMF lent too much to Argentina, a, an amount that was larger than what would be considered safe. Uh, within the for the incentive of the country to pay back but there is the real me big message is this is that if you ask IFIs to share the burden in a debt restructuring to destroy their very ability of lending risk free and, and such you will destroy their value add. and this idea of uh, avoiding sharing the burden burden and being a creditor relies on a common understanding of IFI seniority rule and the really common is by the private sector, they usually understand this by bilateral lenders, mainly the Paris Club, and by the other multilateral. And this is codified in what is the IMF lending into a real policy. Let me just move to this. So, what it is the IMF lending into a real policy? The IMF usually, is there, despite the fact people were worried about the degrees adjustment. Uh, Regarding the case of Argentina, usually private sector accept the seniority of the IMF. The IMF decides that it can ignore the private, it can it, it would not force country to repay private creditor if the fund support is considered essential for the success of the program and the country is pursuing appropriate policy. So the question is that say it's okay for the IMF in the countries in area as long as it behaves with the IMF. And this is, uh, let me say this, this is a very nice explanation by Shen Hagan, that was the former general counsel of the IMF, so he's a top lawyer, and now he's a professor at Georgetown University. And he says that until very recently, this muscular approach said, look, you, and actually was the theory of bailing in of private credit, or take the case of Greece, the IMF say, I enter in a country only if you, default, if you are able to restructure 50% of your credit with private credit. And private credit were sort of, was try to to be all out was very difficult also because some IMF support was needed in order to overcome the crisis. So usually the IMF recently on the policy of bailing in of the bailing in of private creditors tell how much haircut everybody should take on the private side if the IMF wants to intervene. So this is a very muscular approach and until recently was limited to private creditors. Because the, the official like Paris Club by continuing 
were playing together with the IMF. As you know, IMF and World Bank, the IMF and the World Bank participate in any Paris Club meeting. Paris Club, if somebody knows the Association of Creditors, maybe G7 countries, like 22 countries that usually sit together, look at official credits. So the credit of, for instance, that you have a country Argentina vis a vis Italy, so Italy, France, Germany, UK, US, Japan, uh, Russia was part. They meet and say, okay, let, let's do restructuring. We do it fairly. No country has a better treatment than the other. And we give this treatment, we provide new resources. So the IMF can enter and provide resources to overcome a crisis. So it was a sort of a very cozy environment. There are meetings of the Paris Club every month in Paris. And so the main player was able to strike a deal and to have a consensual debt restructuring uh, among themselves. The question is that over time, the, this exclusive reliance, this consensual approach broke down because somebody else joined the club of creditors and is mainly China that was not willing to join the Paris Club. And so if you see now, this is what I'm doing now with Andrea. If, if you look at the behavior of China vis-a-vis -vis the behavior of bilateral donors, you see, for instance, that when my multilateral was entering and giving support to a country, a uh, Paris Club country was doing the same, almost a 45 degrees. So there was sort of the, the Paris Club provided net flows to country. At the moment, there was an IMF and a World Bank problem. And the other, while well, this does not happen with China, in which China's, uh, China's transfer are completely orthogonal uh, to the amount of a multilateral transfer. This is one point. And the second point is that why multilateral in Paris Club are highly anti-cyclical, so they provide more resources in difficult time. And this is when the coefficient of cyclicality is negative. If you take China, is highly pro-cyclical, even more than one holder, meaning that China is there if you are in an economic boom, but it's not really there if you are enduring an economic crisis. What does this mean? This means that faced with this challenge, challenge the IMF decided in 2015 to adopt a policy enable it to lend into arrears to official bilateral credit. And if you want to know why this happened exactly in 2015, it's because the IMF wanted to, be, to continue the program with Ukraine. Ukraine had a uh, view, uh, it was like a 3.5 billion US from the IMF to Ukraine, the uh, Ukraine government owned around 3 billion through Russian banks. And what really didn't want that the arrears of Russia blocked the IMF uh, support to Ukraine. And so we, this, the IMF decided this new lending into official arrears prog project program saying, look, that if you really, the support of the fund is considered is essential, like in the case of private credit. An adapter is making good pay effort to comply with good policy. The IMF can provide financing despite the arrears, official arrears, unless these have an undue negative effect on the fund's ability to mobilize official package in the future. And what does this clause mean? It means when the total of value of the claims all by the official in question represent a majority of total finance with the country else from bilateral. So in the case of Ukraine, it was okay because Ukraine owed money to Russia, but it owed money to many other. The question is more complicated to lending into official arrears in account if this uh, official creditor is a very large share of total credit of the country. And actually where has been applied is lending into official like arrears, well, after the Russia versus Ukraine, it was cases of Central African Republic and Grenada versus Libya, the Gambia versus Venezuela. And if you look, the countries that suffered the, the lending into real policy at the IMF are Russia, Libya, and Venezuela. So it's clear that it it's highly political. They're versing a China on this. And this is, so this policy has been applied in certain cases, and you can probably better than I do, you can read the policies behind this. But it's much more difficult in the case of China, when, as you see now, the share of Chinese, uh, of Chinese lending uh, is increasing over time. And now Chinese lending to DSSI, this is that, that the service uh, support, the, the initiative of uh, for forgiving the debt services during the COVID, 
the amount of China landing is much higher than the amount of landing of, uh, of Paris Plata. Uh, this is the debt um, suspension, uh, debt, no, debt suspension initiative during the COVID crisis. So China, debt service suspension initiative, sorry. And China is a greater shares than any other of the uh, of the bilateral creditors. And if you look in the case of China, the, the the official Chinese debt service of total of official bilateral debt, looking from 2019 to 2024, is of a two two third is is twice uh, the amount of uh, the official service that on the, to official bilateral service like 63 percent. So Chinese is a much larger lender to uh, developing countries than the Paris Club. It's a two to one order of magnitude. And so let's now trying to, to move toward the end of this talk. So, and China is really using these, uh, the high leverage it has and try to exert its market power. And it's in country where its lending is huge. And so the amount, the cost for the country to lose access to the Chinese lending is great. And so the good example is a paper by Gartner and other from the Center of Global Development. It shows that when the nice example in the Seychelles where China's exposure is small, China behave more or less like a Paris Club member and accept the same higher cut of the order of 61% of the existing stock. While in the in Congo Brazzaville, where Beijing has a huge exposure, was able to roll over its debt, but it, it actually what it did, instead of David providing an aircraft, it increased the value of its portfolio in net present terms of about 23%. So they had to restructure the payment, but the future payment would be much higher, and the country would end up with a higher level of indebtedness in than before the debt restructuring. So the questions that we have here in this some eyeball econometric we are doing is that this may be becoming a polarized world in which while the IMF is where the China is a larger, a larger share in the larger way, this country would go to China and build a long-term relationship with China. But the reaction of the IMF is that the credit or standing of the IMF, and this we measure in terms of a quota, is negatively correlated for the public external. So this is the wrong figure. This is, is not, uh, is not is not a Paris study is China. But is that um uh that's not statistically significant, is it? No, this there. is the wrong okay. I'm sorry, this is the wrong chart. I, I, I got the wrong chart in the presentation. If you have the uh, credit outstanding vis-a-vis -vis the IMF, and here we have China, just copy the wrong chart, where the uh, robust standard is like 1.7 is significant. Mm -hmm. So we have a significant rela negative relation, and I'm sorry, just Got the wrong chart into the presentation that between the credit outstanding vis a vis IMF and the credit return that owed to China, not to uh, Paris Club. And I will show you the chart. So, if I can find, but it's negative. So, there is a polarization where you have a higher uh, Chinese debt, you have less uh, IMF exposure. I'm sorry for picking up the, the wrong figure. And actually, if you look at, uh, I just received this tweet for uh, Serge Lanau, who is the deputy chief economist of the Institute for International Finance, the sort of association of the major financial institutions across the world. Just it came yesterday after the, the annual meeting at the IMF at the World Bank last weekend. He said that the debt distress lesson from the annual meeting is the following one. China wants to roll over and get multilaterals to restructure loans. G7 wants multilaterals untouched and traditional bilateral debt to forgiveness. Harder to see how things can get smoother from here. Not great for the likes of Sri Lanka or other highly indebted countries. This is the idea of, an of what can bring an healthy competition between, say, China and the West, when China has a larger, larger amount of credit outstanding vis a vis developing countries. So let me just conclude so we can have some discussion. I think the bottom line is until 15 years ago, uh, international financial assistance has been a G7 friend, a family and friends game. And so there was agreements that were making at the Paris Club meeting in which were the major bilateral donors, IMF or Bank, a regional development bank. 
So the real equation is that can it become a G20's games? The, at the beginning, it seems it could be the case if you take the Chiang Mai initiatives in which China and other Asian central bank uh, provided line of credit among themselves. It was started as a sort of competing against the IMF, but then probably because China was not very confident that the country was implementing the right policy, they decided that access to the Chinese credit lines through the Chiang Mai initiative should country would need to have an IMF program. So it seems a sort of cooperation, international financial architecture. The debts service suspension initiatives that was launched mainly by the World Bank and the IMF at the beginning of the COVID, try to put all countries together, both Paris Club and North Paris Club. And at the end, it were many countries after a lot of force, actually of forcing from international financial institution to accept this service, most of bilateral uh, creditor offer country that they released and China share, to be honest, was among the highest, was the country that offered the last largest amount of debt relief. So we move from the debt uh, service suspension initiative to the common framework, in which it was the idea to open to China what was uh, before just the Paris Club uh, meetings in order to provide that relief to country. The situation has not gone so well. Recently, there are only three countries at the end applied to the uh, common framework, was Zambia, Chad, and Ethiopia. The Zambia deal was closed uh, a few weeks ago. In Chad, they decided that because of the high oil prices, Chad doesn't need any more debt relief. In the case of Ethiopia, an agreement between uh, IFI's debt outstanding and Chinese is not yet there. And actually, during the crisis, it was known the IMF agreed to give Three billion to Ethiopia, the million they have to repaying a bullet uh, China loans. So there is a lot of, of uh, acrimony and competi and discussion among the right terms. Another, of the, what are the obstacles? Well, there are more technical obstacles. One is that there is a bl very blurry line between what is commercial and non -com and official Chinese debt. There is the Exim Bank, the Chinese Development Bank Corporation (CDC) that are treated sometimes as uh, uh, official, sometimes as private. And so they can try always to, to circumvent existing deal in their most favorable situation. And there is an overload, lack of transparency over uh, Chinese debt and the kind of terms that Chinese offer to countries often is contingent, is, is that it is contingent, is collateralized credit where collateralization can occur through, uh, com through uh, deposit of commodity or escrow accounts and so on. And so on. But on the other side of the Chinese one, there is an un also an underrepresentation of China in the Bretton Woods institution when the Chinese quota is still smaller than the Japanese one, despite the fact that the Chinese economy is much larger. And probably there is a much broader issue that international aid, it can be a tool for ensuring and forgetting and grabbing natural resources. And this, there is a sort of a zero sum uh, nature of that game in which you can have further and further. It's difficult to reach a consensus when uh, what I can grab if I'm big enough is at your expenses. So just to close is that I think through this research, what we have shown is that the idea that we can have healthy competition among the IFIs is the, the Asian Infrastructure Bank and the World Bank Group or the Asian Development Bank and the New Development Bank or the BRIC banks, or between official lenders. Let's say Paris Club versus China is a fallacy. You cannot have this competition, but you need to coordinate among those. And I think the big point we're trying to make is competition among international financial institutions will destroy their preferred creditor status. This preferred creditor status is very much needed to fulfill their mandate. And the same competition among official lenders between China and between Paris Club and non-Paris Club may end up destroying the very functioning international financial architecture. So I think we saw and here I really don't know what the solution is. And maybe people that are more versed in, in international affairs will provide an answer that I cannot offer. Is the fact that at the end there should be China and the West should decide between collaborating, competing splitting the world in areas of influences on any combination of the three. And actually being in size, I let you, I would like you to tell me uh, which one is more likely. Based on
on that, on that on that last question, remember you don't work for the World Bank, the IMF anymore, so you, you can actually answer those questions yourself. If you'd like. <laughs> no, but I really don't. It's not the fact that I don't know is not because I I want to take a position for the IMF or the World Bank, but it is very unclear the kind of agreement that uh, I mainly the, the World Bank. Honestly, the World Bank is not an issue. The World Bank, the World Bank, continue to offer usually a steady flows of credit to countries, and are usually is little money. So, it gives country payback, but it's just a fraction of GDP. So they, they know the World Bank is there. Really, the real the real player is the IMF. Mm -hmm. The IMF is the one who puts really money on the table, and this money should be repaid fast. So at this point, there's some situation in which I was in a board meeting of the bank. It was K of Ethiopia. To accept, okay, there is this bullet payment for China. The World Bank gave this money, but but it was last two or three billion. One, once you enter huge amount of lending, what would the IMF do, and what would China? Do? And this is the reason why all these agreements, in the case uh, in many developing countries, one in Congo is you, are are going nowhere because there is this this bargaining between uh, Bretton Woods Institute, many the IMF, in China. That doesn't want to be part of the Paris Club. This is the part of the problem. And they are bargaining on a case by case, not a case by case. The Paris Club was born exactly to avoid this ad hoc negotiation in every deal. We have all creditors miss once per month and we decide. So I, I think the real thing, but it is really above, above what I understand, is the fact that one thing is, is where is, what, what would be the interest? Would be in the interest of China to be a large player of Bretton Woods institution. They, the U.S. now are blocking the increase of the uh, sharing of the quota, the increase of the Chinese quota for domestic or political reasons. So it's a bargaining, it's a global bargaining, and right. I do not have the answer. So, so if I could just uh, begin with a question yes. about on that very point that, you know, looking at your slides, you've got this, uh, unlike the Paris Club and other organizations, you've got this positive correlation between Chinese lending and growth. So if you think of the IMF as being there to lend, uh, supposed to be lending in a balance of payments basis so countries can get back to short-term credit markets. So the IMF does that, gets them back to short-term credit markets and the Chinese lends to them. That seems to be almost a problematic relationship, no? It is indeed. So the real problem is that, we'll, so if the IMF gets in, and in those years, it provides new resources. The IMF doesn't want to provide new resources. These resources are going to bail out Chinese credit. Yeah, so that's it. This, yeah. Is, this is the point. And the Chinese, at some point, do not want to put much resources if they think the Paris Club get a better deal. Mm -hmm. But I think it's most of this idea for the West that is more suspicion vis-a-vis -vis China. And the question is that where the equilibrium is, I don't know. But honestly, I think this is much more... Uh, more international relation or in, uh, an international relation problem rather than a poorly economic But if problem. you had, if China had a bigger say, like a truly proportional say in the Bretton Woods institutions, would that help? It might help, but I'm not sure that China wants it. So the question, that's, that's right. <laughs> so China wants a bigger, a bigger share in the Red Finance institution, but still the US has a bit of power. And now the Chinese lending is so much bigger than yeah. the one of Paris Club, that Chinese uh, said, look, I, this is the Seychelles and Congo brother Vickers. If you are small, you can go ahead. If you are a long-term relation and this relation is on larger infrastructure and maybe Chinese firms have to have big investment at the stake, we we'll say no. So I really, okay, interesting, interesting stuff. Well, we've, we've got some time for questions yeah. and Giorgio uh, will have a first one, but I do want to mention we have, you know, over 30 people online and if you want to ask a question uh from zoom land uh please put it in the q and a box okay so uh why don't we take a few questions and then uh yeah. together so professor Bazavi. um in a way the question i raised before about the uh, span of time was considered and it was before the war with ukraine uh becomes now becomes now the one really I had in mind, that is the uh, how the game will be called uh, uh, by China seems to me that now very much depends on the fact that China is essential 
to uh, some solution to the war with Russia. Right. And so you cannot just say, well, that comes after, uh, so at least in the graph, it was up to 21. Uh, we have to consider 22 and 23, which is future. But it seems to me that now China is really leading the game. I agree. And I, I do not have much to say on this. What I'm, my hunch, hunch is the fact that maybe there would be different strategies in different regions. So maybe China will take the lead in all the area that was on the Belt and Road Initiatives, given all the amount of stake there. Maybe I can envisage big fights, maybe in certain countries, Latin America, like uh, Nicaragua with the new competing investment against the Panama Canal. But I, the, what I'm saying, this is really geopolitical. So I, what I can say is that what the only things economic analysis in my view, what we say, we cannot think that competition, there could be healthy competition. The idea, our view, it is our contribution is showed that in this case, competition is bad. Because if there is competition, not there is a bad equilibrium, a sort of a prisoner dilemma in which nobody would provide support to the country when needs it. And doesn't provide support because of the fear that if he provides support and the competing block doesn't, this money would be used not to help the country, but to bail out the credit sort of the competing block. But on the other, I agree with you. And the, all the geopolitics will play a major role, but as... <laughs> It's an eco from our model, there's not much I can say in the kind of agreement that at the geopolitical level would be reached. Of course, Belt and Road Initiative lending has come down a lot over yeah. the last couple of years. It'd be interesting to see where that goes. I mean, it was like went like this, and China's having its own issues right now. So it'd be interesting to see where that where that goes. Um, Chris, thanks. Thank you. That was a very nice lecture. Um, I wonder to the to what extent the Chinese lending, which is um, a large to a large extent commercially and politically motivated, is turning out uh, to be quite unprofitable, and whether to that extent, um, two things, perhaps China will reduce its lending substantially. But secondly, it's not obvious to come back to your initial question: why countries should repay China? Look, to be, to be fair on the China side, well, if you look at the longer time series, it seems that uh, uh, the behavior of China is very similar to the behavior of uh, Paris Club creditor previously to the Brady deal. And so the question, I don't think China is doing something that France didn't do before. Yeah. So it's just, so <laughs> let, let's be very frank. It's not that I said. And at the end, if you take that view, that view is that there is all this landing for grabbing natural resources, uh, not in some uh, predator in which country I've been, uh, the IMF people begging me to forgive some debt because it was nobody knew where the debt ended up. So poor Korea. So there is two ways. One is this idea of collaboration, is equilibrium in which China. At some point, they will realize that all this is not sustainable. You need an orderly resolution of that problem, and this becomes part of the Paris Club, maybe which a major with a, a major role in the Paris Club because it's the major land. So the question, so my question, my question is that in the past it was the same. Uh, Paris Club lender was rolling, rolling over debt and debt until the Brexit in Latin America and until the EPIC for uh, poor countries in the late 1990s, early 2000s. And now there is a difficult approach that are more, more lenient and more ready to forgive. So they learned the lesson. China is new to the game, maybe it learned the lesson, and uh, this would be the solution. I think it can be pretty likely. Want to, um, we've got so, a few questions online. What transparency measure do you think, but you, you summarized the fellow one because it's long. I don't, okay. okay. <laughs> What transparency measure do you think should be implemented to the eliminate the obstacle of overlap? Of, look, the transparency is a very big issue. The World Bank, when uh, Carmen Reina was the chief economist, the top on her agenda was exactly enhancing transparency of Chinese debt. And this is very much linked to her own research with uh, Christoph Trebesch and other. 
So the idea is that you would like to have a deal in which uh, all that, uh, and there is a lot of things that international financial institutions are doing in order to implement transparency. And mainly the idea is that to link new lending, lending light to transparency about the existing stock of debt and overdue obligation. And this is, the World Bank is doing it pretty actively, not only on a private, on public debt, but also on public guaranteed debt in order to find out if there is something state-owned enterprises that owes uh, big loans from China or other lenders that are not in the budget. So international financial institutions are trying to play hard also because they're very much worried of providing money uh, to country and this money ends up uh, in some side deal, giving preferential treatment to some police, in this case, Chinese lenders. So, but is again, the question is that the point is that whether is a country is a big credit is in China, then it may not want, maybe in the terms of the contract, or the, it was written that this condition could not be disclosed, what can be done? Okay. Um, a um, question from uh, Professor Rafael del Sarto. Uh, thanks you for the interesting presentation and was wondering whether you could comment on the IMF's conditions attached to lending money to indebted countries, and more specifically the structural adjustment programs. Uh, the SAPs have been criticized for their priorities and they are very unpopular among indebted countries as they risk to foment social unrest. For example, in the Middle East, the SAP reforms of the 80s caused waves of protest uh, uh, called uh, bread riots. I suppose yes. China does not attach the same conditions the IMF when it lends money, yeah. uh, which would explain why China has become popular among indebted countries. Can this be an explanation? If so, uh, is the IMF reconsidering the type of this type of con conditionality? But you know, with the IMF is a is actually reconsidered quite substantially this type of conditionality. For instance, if you take the Argentinian, and I'm not defending the IMF, but I think, but if you take, for instance, the, the Argentinian program, the binding the binding condition on social spending. So I think that. <coughs> The IMF is in these mm. times is changing a lot. I think it has learned some of the lessons, or at least it pretends it has learned this lesson. So I, I think, honestly, I think the <coughs> structural agenda is partially over, not necessarily. But the question is that the real problem, and we can have a long discussion, it can be, and we as Rafael would like to discuss this more at all, but I think the real problem here is rather the problem of fiscal sustainability. So the question is that, yes, it's true. China doesn't attach much condition, but the question of not attaching condition is also the reason why in the Chiangmai Initiative, Chinese, when it was real central bank money, decided we give the money, only there is the IMF because they can implement the condition we cannot implement. So there is macro condition to be uh, in place. And I think if you look at the IMF recently, most of the projects I think I would criticize from the by from the opposite sense, take the project from Argentina was the re, the recent problem. There is no conditionality at all. It's free money. Fine with Argentina. It is free money because uh, uh, Argentina wouldn't pay the IMF back. Take the other big project that Ukraine. Okay, you understand, but there's nothing to do with an IMF project. I think there will be other agencies that provides money in times of conflict. Take the case of Pakistan. It's free money just for. Uh, for political reasons. So the big Iraq was, so if you take the big project of the IMF, honestly, it's rather, it's very liberal, but very liberal, very liberal, very free money, but fulfilling of a political mandate that is no more the change of the government in developing country, but being, but keeping the big alliance, its alignment with the major shareholders of the IMF. So mm -hmm. honestly, if I had to criticize the IMF on this side, it's mainly to see because it, if it is in the interest of its major shareholders, it gives money with no conditionality attached, pretending that there is a program. And in, can be, I think in the case of Argentina, Ukraine, Pakistan, Iraq, there is no program. Right. So, and you were saying yeah. earlier that the IMF is learning, aren't these the policy reduction strategy papers anyway, aren't they bottom up uh, approaches now? To yeah, but if you take the COVID land on, on what the IMF that did recently, and that is just, they decided that also this 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 landing that is a short term facility with with no conditionality the silos double. So the IMF, especially now before with Christine Lagarde, but now with Christina Georgieva, 
Many of the IMF wants to become popular, it wants to win the popularity contest with giving more and more money with less and less conditionality attached. And honestly, while with Rafael, I look, I have been in meeting in the IMF in which I, I've seen the worst of IMF conditionality in the past. A special encounter did not have the ability to push back on the reform that made no sense. I've been in meeting at the IMF in which he said, you have to privatize seven public enterprises by the end of time. Which one? We did five. No, we did do one more. It was totally nonsense. I've seen all these, so I'm not at all defending the structural adjustment project, but I think if you look at the actual IMF lending nowadays, I think the way in which I would criticize is maybe to have too few conditions attached. Isn't it great to be an academic again? You can say- It's great, so, no, it's great. <laughs> so there's a, a, a second question from Morgan Cannon. Um, if China and the West decided uh, on the competing strategy, how would you see this playing out? What I would say is that the country of a large exposure with China would not get an IMF program and would uh, continue some lending, some restructuring of uh, Chinese uh, debt. Uh, lengthening of maturity, uh, changing the net present values, and countries that have little uh, IMF, little Chinese lending on which the West to want to put, or that are important for the West, they would mainly uh, get a lot of money from the IMF, trying to, in part, default on part of the Chinese debt, or they, in order to keep this relation to be more lenient in the debt the, the into to be either tough on the lending into official arrears or more lenient accepting that the part of the money, like in case of Ethiopia, will go to China. Okay, any other questions? Chris. Thank you, Tito, for the very informative uh, presentation. Um, I just want to get your thoughts on whether, how you, how you, how you see or, or, or dis agree or disagree with, with you know, this perspective. Um, China isn't so much a competitor against the IFIs. The, the nature of their credit to IFI, uh, to to to, uh, to borrowing countries is, is not the same. It's not emergency lending. It's not le it's not offered at at the, at the near market terms or near <clears throat> near risk free terms. Um, it comes with, you know, uh, and and also uh, the treatment of of the situation when a default arises is very different. I would rather see China as more of a competitor to Paris Club and to the you know the the non IFIs. Um, and, I agree. And, well, okay, good. But then you know, I also was thinking that the reason why this is an equilibrium to me is because. The IFI, uh, sorry, the, the Paris Club creditors and the, uh, the and China and other uh, uh, non-IFI creditors are happy to let um, the IMF take the role of being the emergency lender in a bounce of payments crisis or similar, and to have the preferred creditors uh, treatment that they have because they absolve them of the risk, right? They either bail them out, right? Or, or if a haircut has to be taken, they at least have the possibility of reclaiming value for loans that they hold, even after the senior creditor, the IFIs are paid, because the IFIs are able to get some kind of adjustment and performance on the part mm -hmm. of the, the, uh, the debtor governments, which in theory would enhance their ability to repay the 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 loan the restructured loans at the end of, at the end of it all, and in that case you get an equilibrium where at least there's some value for what otherwise would be pretty much distressed assets and uh, you know, a deeper haircut than otherwise. That's kind of like uh, kind of like what I'm thinking might be why this is an equilibrium, right? But it's also also only an equilibrium because the Taxpayers or the governments that represent the taxpayers have exercised a lot of forbearance on the part of IFIs um, to the degree that they're allowing more lending, as I'm seeing now, that has less conditionality attached to it. That if you were a shareholders of, of, of Paris Club uh, or, uh, or your taxpayers of a single country, they might not be as willing to go along 
with certain programs. Right? Okay. I'm thinking of, of Argentina in particular uh, recently. But, you know, I mean, this is, this is an equilibrium, but it also is one that's contingent on, on the continued support by the member governments, or the large ones at least, of the, of the, uh, of the IMF's, uh, uh, you know, uh, membership. Okay, there are a lot of questions. Yeah. Let me try to summarize, try to get a few points. I totally agree. The problem is not competition between China and IFF. The problem is whether the competition between China and the Paris Club would make impossible for the IFIs to provide the rest of the programs they provided until now. This is exactly the point of view. When this can be a clean equilibrium, I want to write a model now. I try to sketch a model exactly to understand this. If you have there be, so what are the kind of is a bargaining game in which it's clear that it's better if somebody enter enters and provide fresh money. But the question is that what it is optimal for you to have an old South strategy. So I don't know. This is this is a question. How can it be an equilibrium for many equilibrium? But I'm a game. I, I want to see to see the condition for which this is an equilibrium. So I need to write a model. Before writing a model, I cannot tell you what an equilibrium is. And the question is, is a very complicated game. I don't think on the taxpayer, I don't see much. First of all, IFI do not cost much to taxpayers. Usually, they are almost always repaid, and they're pretty well capitalized. Mm. Honestly, I rather think that the opposite, rather to be true. What I've seen in Bretton Woods <coughs> institution is that our governments that want to use IFIs to pursue their policy without having to use domestic real taxpayer money. So I think the pressure, except certain cases, even the case of the Greek crisis, but it's not that Germany was really screaming for the bailout of the German banks. So what I want to say, I don't see that on the test, but you can see in some uh, free market Republican on the, some editor in the Wall Street Journal, but I wouldn't see much in, in many of the parliaments across the world. Okay. Um... You got to be careful in your model. I bet you get multiple equilibria. We have multiple <laughs> equilibria. This is what this is what I'm sure we lack. Well, we're, we're we're coming down close to the end, but I, I did want to, since this is a size group, I I can't resist but asking this question because you you refer to it during the talk, but I thought I'd bring it out in the open. And, and the example is it, interestingly is the Philippines. Uh, if you have a situation where you've got a government that is corrupt and like a dictatorship, and then you get a revolution. What are the responsibilities after that? I mean, Florian Naburo, I remember these, a lot of Philippine economists are saying, <clears throat> the Marcos regime over 15 years had borrowed all of this money and it was all corrupt. Marcos is gone. Why should we have to pay that back? <clears throat> this is, a, these are honestly, there is all the works that Michael Kramer worked who did on audio's death. <laughs> The question is that um, it goes can look. I, I do not have much to say. In the sense, this again is uh, you should see what is the charter of different international financial institutions when they are allowed to to when and where you are allowed to lend. But this honestly is more. I, I think this is a decision that the boards of inter so are you UN, UN agency. So at some point. You can say, I think that what is the due diligence that is needed that sometimes is not done is whether are there the condition to fulfill the objective of the program, given the level of corruption of yeah. malgovernance uh, and so on and so forth. And too many times is, this is important. And, and I go back to the example of uh, Iraq. So we really wanted to give money. The level of corruption was extreme, but fine, and you pretend it was not because it was important to keep the government afloat. This is what happened. But these, honestly, I think the real problem often in many in this case, and this goes in the, this, in the question of governance of international financial institutions, that it is important to have a clear separation between the decisions that are technical and the ones that are political. For instance, when you are taking the Argentina, the Argentinian crisis in 2003, can they see in, uh, in Stan Fisher decided let the, the, sta the AMF staff to have a negative uh, recommendation 
to provide support to Argentina in 2000, and the board overruled the stat. This, I think, is good governance. When you go to the Greek scale, Christine Lagarde did what, all what could in order to force the staff to uh, agree on a program which the staff did not believe. Mm -hmm. So the question is that I think when you go to this is this program and going to dictator on different situations, I think what it is crucial is to say what is the governance, what is the governance of international financial institution. It's not up, and I do not want to defend the IFI staff, but it's not, it should not be up to the staff to decide if you are to land or do a program with a corrupt government, with a brutal dictator, this should be gone from the board. So I think, I think my, my, in many of the debates on people that have very negative view, and I can go, have a lot of criticisms of it vis a vis some of the aspects of international financial institutions. But the question is that it would be more important to look into the government and who should be responsible mm -hmm. for what. And if you think that a program should not be fine, you should go to the Italian executive director and say vote against. Mm -hmm. right. Okay. Now we have um, our colleague uh, in DC, Vikram Nehru, has two questions. First, says, Hi, Tito, excellent talk. Uh, <laughs> First question, how many low income countries are at high risk of debt distress uh, using bank IMF DSAs and how much outstanding sovereign debt is at stake? Similarly, how many middle income countries have serious sovereign debt repayment problems and how much is, uh, is their outstanding sovereign debt? I think he's not looking for the exact number, but uh, in general. Well, I pro I think Vikram probably may know these numbers better than <laughs> I do because the DSA is really building upon uh, some of his some his work. Uh, honestly, what we saw, and I look at this number a couple of years ago for the DSSI, there is uh, mm -hmm. um, the numbers are, are very different country by country. So we have counted a huge amount of outstanding debt and debt coming due soon, others that are not. So my point is that and here, I do not want to say something that especially because we have registered, I do not know the, I do not have the number on the top, top of my head, but I think it is, it's really more on account. They are counted a large one, larger one on vis-a-vis -vis private market, sometimes vis-a-vis -vis different kinds of creditors. So the analysis should be on a country by country base. Okay, and his second question is... Uh, in I know I didn't answer the question, but I don't know the answer. Let me be there. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> one can tell you worked for the bank for 20 years. So. Uh, in normal Paris Club <laughs> agreements, debt restructuring or relief is provided with the requirement that all creditors, including private creditors through the London Club, incur a similar reduction in their debt outstanding in uh, NBV terms. Why can't this these requirements also be up? Uh, apply to outstanding Chinese debt. This would force debtors to, to curtail their debt service to China in amounts similar to the reductions in their debt service to Paris Club. Members. Okay, so this is, is, a, is a, I can answer in different steps. The first one is that nowadays there is no more London Club. It's mainly the inter, issue for international finance that did most in all the debate and the DSSI, it was with the IIF. So the question is that, uh, and on the other thing, what is important to see is that nowadays, many of these, the bonds, private commercial bonds, are a higher seniority status than bilateral debt. And if you take the DSSI, that was, I think was not very well conceived. It was a very nice uh, uh, PR exercise. And many will say, uh, they said, country now can, can have these debt services um, suspension with, uh, I, with the World Bank, no, with uh, bilateral and the credit, commercial creditors. Nobody wanted to do with commercial creditor because this would have put the old stock of debt under, under default and would have affected negatively the credit rate. So uh, the condition, the question is that, um, I'm sorry, just, so the question is that you want the, the kind of, if you told the DSSI, you wanted to have the uh, commercial creditor to take the same uh, debt suspension as the official, and the council decided not to do because the debt suspension with the commercial was more uh, was more costly from a from for the cost of 
of their writing services. So on the outstanding Chinese debt, you, this is the lending in the official areas. And usually there is a nice paper by article on the FT by Mitu Gulat and the others say, let's use the most preferred prefer creditor uh, criteria in which people, countries agree on, on some criteria. And if the country was offering better deal to China, they would restructure all the existing deal. So the idea of using, of using different legal strategy for even equality of trade treatment and to use this equality of treatment to ever, sitting everything at the table is very much at the center on the political debate. The idea of forcing China, the question is that is the lending into official area policy, you can do when China has a small state, if most of the debt is Chinese debt, well, this policy does not apply. Mm -hmm. So the question is, is also very difficult for the IMF to say, we lending the official, if you, if you default on China, when China has so many outstanding loans, the country who want to pay back China. And so some of this money would be siphoned on that way. So this is, is a very complicated thing. And I think it would be very difficult to find a solution unless there's a new agreement like, like the, the common framework that was created again, against to have all China, all Paris club and non Paris club members sitting around the same table. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, uh, Neela Horton, who's a student at Howard University asks, uh, do you think if members of the Paris Club met Chinese officials in a way they find culturally appropriate, China would be more willing to provide transparency? Uh, also in the post-pandemic world, do you think China will become more guarded as a result of backlash, backlash China faced socially during the pandemic? I never been to a, a I've never participated in a meeting at the Paris Club, so I really don't know about okay. the cultural appropriateness of, mm -hmm. uh, of that meeting. So I, I cannot answer. Uh, look, regarding the result of Black Chef's history, the pandemic, honestly, I think it is, it, of course, there are many things in Chinese landing that are linked to, like in any country, landing that are linked to the domestic uh, economic, political economy situation. So it may matter the way in which matter, I don't know. The question is that I don't think, I think the real risk is that maybe China, even if we can have problem in rolling over some of the existing credit because of maybe some of the weak financial conditions that public bank or state-owned enterprise may face. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and right. another question is from Katerina Yang. Um, what are, what are the implications of, of these new developments on debt relief initiatives and actions? Is China also doing things differently to relieve debts, debts compared to the, the HIPIC initiative and the MDRI? Okay. Honestly, I think, I think in major the debate of debt relief, my only position is that probably we have looked at, we have looked at the wrong indicators. We have looked at the stock of debt and not the debt flows of debt. If you take EPIC, so the question is that most of the creditor was already providing net, even during the debt crisis, were providing positive net flows to most of the country every single year. So what EPIC did is cancel the stock of debt. But if you do post EPIC, the amount of net credit to most of the country went down. So, I think in the debt relief initiative, there is, uh, there is something um, we should pay very attention. We should not want to be some sort of Potemkin window effect. Mm. There is a lot. So I think the real problem is that what you did with CPIC is that at some point by, by canceling the, the stock of debt, you allowed country to have access to international credit market. And this is part of, uh, despite the fact that there were some condition to have no new non-concessional uh, debt, it was never applied by the World Bank of the IMF. Mm -hmm. So the country started increasing the stock of debt. So my own view is that rather than one, one solution is debt relief, but I think what institution, multilateral institutions do, do more is to encourage countries to default on their debt. Mm -hmm. And in the sense, there is no reason, even especially, for instance, the, the stock of commercial debt. If you have a, a commercial debt that you pay 700 basis points over the risk-free rate, and you have an haircut of 50% of that, it means that you are, you are paying for a default every seven, eight years. 
-hmm. So, so this is already in the price. Yeah, that's right. So you should induce more counter to default. And now the question exactly mm -hmm. of that relief is to see you can, this is one of the things I want to work on is to go to look at the net flows. For instance, there is the, the DSS side was a great, everybody participated, but did country receive more or less larger or, lo or smaller debt credit flows, transfer flows in this period? I don't know, because you have a, you can cancel my payment of 100, but instead of giving 200, I give you 100, so the two things wash out. So I think we should not look too much at the stock of that, and you should rather look more at the net flows. Okay, good. And our, our last question uh, is from uh, Alberto Cantu, who asked, do you think that the IFC should put in place programs to sustain economies, including Western European economies, in facing the Ukraine economic crisis? Yes, but they should not have any preferred credit of three. Okay. <laughs> Pretty clear. Yeah. Okay, um, I lied, it isn't the last question. I do wanna ask one more question. Yeah. That is simply, besides this work that you you took us through with, that you're doing with Andrea Presbitero, what are your plans over the next uh, five years as the Zamani professor? What kind of research do you wanna do? You wanna to continue to do research in this end or do you have other things that you've got? Look, I have, uh, there, are things, there are two main areas of research that I continue working on. One is really on, the, on the, the on let's say on the instrument used to provide uh, development and assistance, and it's like twenty years and more. So it can be mm -hmm. on the debt relief side, on how to design new financial instrument, on debt relief market access. I work on this for the last probably twenty years. It's something we like to continue. The second area that I'm working is really on uh, on financial instrument to shift risk. We have this all agenda on uh, GDP index bonds and maybe apply to other kind of uh, uh, bond indexation toward different sources of risk, looking at how different agents, uh, how the shifting of risk can be good and bad. That is not, we assume that all shifting is good through insurance, but may, may, may not be always the case. So these are the two areas like financial instruments, financial stability, and the financial instrument, the other on development, uh, development assistance and the incentives that donor and uh, aid recipient community have is in pursuing policies foster long-term development, looking at the financial side. But what I really hope, and the reason I, look, I through my career, I, I think one of the things that working in IFI, when I moved from academia to international financial institutions that I was, prone to have a lot of model looking for a real um, <laughs> real policy application. And rather when you go working more in the field, you have a lot of, of policy of problems that may need to find a way of uh, uh, look, instrument to look into the problem to find some solution. And I think what is good, especially in a place like size in which you have a, a very multidisciplinary faculty, is the idea I hope to have, uh, to be challenged to try to this guy said find solutions to problem I did not even know that it existed before. Because I'm a curious mind. Okay. This is what... <laughs> Great. Well, well, uh, thanks so much, Tito. I think the all of the questions and, and the debates sort of underscore how uh, interesting the topic was mm -hmm. and how great the presentation uh, was. So I think all that's left is to thank you for your presentation and welcome to SICE. Thank you so thank much you. for having me here. Tu conosci Marco Boggero? Mm. Ti fa complimenti, è un ex sì. nostro. Ciao. Ciao.